Sting. I think we got sound very good. Well, thank you, and Merry Christmas uh, to all of you as well. And uh, yeah, Dave, I was actually born in Montreal, and uh, Canada is a place where they get these warm Chinooks blowing through, uh, where the temperature goes from minus 60 all the way up to plus 20. And with that 80 degree temperature jump, everybody goes outside in their t-shirts and shorts and baths in the warm 20 degree weather. So, and uh, yeah, when I was at the University of Toronto, we would play hockey outside at 15 below, and yeah, you didn't want to sit in a bench. You wanted to be playing the whole time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there was no place to keep warm. So, understand uh, what you went through there, uh, uh, Dave. So, last couple of weeks, uh, two weeks ago, I was actually in Paradise, uh, Paradise, California. <laughs> First time I've been to Paradise, and I actually got to come back, so. <laughs> now, I was teaching a course there, uh, a science and a faith course, and I had these students from literally uh, Hawaii, the East Coast, everywhere, uh, participating through this amazing Zoom technology, or I could see all their faces, they could see me, they could see my visuals. And, uh, you know, it's amazing what you can do with this new technology in the teaching uh, classes. And so I uh, did that for an entire weekend, uh, talked to, gave a couple of talks in a church, and I'm still doing that course every Thursday night. Uh, we continue the course. So, and then uh, last Sunday, I was in uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, where we're basically uh, planning uh, a major uh, gospel push throughout the Pacific Rim. Uh, the plan is to go to you know Seoul and Tokyo, Osaka, Kobe, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore and uh, some of the big Chinese cities, Kuala Lumpur, etc., uh, with uh, a collection of incredible uh, Bible manuscript facsimiles, perfect facsimiles. And I got to see them. Like, for example, they duplicated the Isaiah scroll that's on display in Jerusalem. And uh, it's an exact duplicate, all done with animal parchments, and uh, all done by hand, where people actually put that you know, I can't imagine uh, doing Hebrew by hand. You know, Greek is one thing, but with Hebrew, the thickness of the line counts and uh, the degree of the line, whether it's straight down or whatever. And uh, it looked like it was typeset, but it was actually all done by hand. Uh, but what they did is they got some of us to come uh, follow up and say, here's some reasons why we know the Bible is the authoritative, inspired, inerrant word of God. And so I was commissioned to give the scientific evidence uh, for that being the case. That was wonderful, just engaging people, especially through the Q&A. It's just amazing the questions that the people ask. So, uh, and while I was gone, uh, this book came out. It's the Four Views book that I participated in uh, about nine months ago. And it's uh, four different positions on creation, evolution, and intelligent design uh, by the four presidents of the organization's Answers in Genesis, Reasons to Believe, uh, BioLogos, and the Discovery Institute. And I think what I appreciated most was the opportunity to actually set the record straight on uh, what we believe and why we believe, what our mission is, and why we take our mission, because Reasons to Believe has been widely misrepresented in terms of what we believe and what we're all about. And this was an opportunity for me to basically say, no, we don't believe that, we believe this, and no, our mission objective is this and not that. And so I think that's going to be very helpful for us. And then all last week, uh, I've never seen NASA push something as aggressively as they did. I mean, gee, about 10 days ago, they kept saying, we're going to make a major announcement. You all got to listen. We're going to uh, release it on the Thursday. And so every day they were telling people, you know, we're going to uh, you know, make this major announcement, uh, biggest discovery ever. And uh, so it finally came out on Thursday and it was the Kepler-90 planetary system. So I just wanted to do a survey. I mean, the way NASA's pushed this, you think everybody's heard of Kepler-90. So how many of you have heard of Kepler-90? I have. Okay, well, a good third of you, <coughs> two thirds of you, this is probably the first time you're hearing about Kepler-90, is that about right? Okay, so maybe all that NASA publicity didn't go as far as it would. And I was kind of predicting that because NASA has done that so frequently that people are basically saying, oh yeah, it's just NASA again. Um, and so uh, I think they're, uh, 
their marketing is actually starting to backfire. And I'm concerned it will backfire more based on the hype that they gave to this uh, discovery. Now, uh, here are some of the comments that were made about the discovery. It's the first solar system just like ours. And this is boosting the chances of finding alien life elsewhere in the universe. Now, let me get to the bottom line, what was really discovered. What was really discovered, this was interesting, it was a partnership between NASA and Google. Google basically said, look, we got these amazing algorithms and search engines. How about if we simply mine the Kepler spacecraft data and see if we can squeeze more out of the data than what you've been able to do with your not so sophisticated software? They didn't put it that way. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, they were able to go through uh, their software and say, you know, this Kepler 90 system where you thought that you'd only had seven planets in it, we found an eighth planet. So that was the thing. We finally found a planetary system with eight planets, just like the solar system. The solar system's got eight. Now that Pluto's been demoted, we're down to just eight. Okay, now they found another sim a planetary system with eight. That's where all the similarity ends. Same number of planets as we have, but everything about the Kepler-90 system is radically different from our solar system. But that's not what the hype said. The hype said we just found a system just like ours. This is boosting the chances that we're going to find alien life elsewhere. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next slide are the sizes of the Kepler-90 planets relative to the sizes of the solar system planets. Okay, so here's the uh, comparison. And what you notice is every one of the Kepler-90 planets is bigger than planet Earth. I mean, the smallest one is 20% bigger in diameter. Now, that also means its volume is going to be almost double the volume of uh, the Earth. And so what you see are three small ones, uh, all about uh, 30, 20 to 30% bigger than the Earth. They're the ones that are in close. The next three are uh, almost the size of uh, Neptune and Uranus. It's a little bit smaller than Neptune and Uranus. And then you've got two Jupiter-sized ones farther out. Now, this is actually quite typical of extrasolar planetary systems. In fact, I wrote a blog that's up on my Facebook page and also on the Reasons to Believe page where a group of scientists analyzes 623 multi-planet systems. These are all the planetary systems where there's at least two or more planets in the system. And they said, what we've noticed in looking at that database is that in extrasolar planetary systems, the planets all tend to be the same size, unlike the solar system where they have all variety of different sizes. You've got tiny Mercury all the way up to Jupiter, and uh, you know, the, in terms of the mass differences, it's literally a factor of a thousand difference between the smallest one and the biggest one, whereas what's typical in these extraplanetary systems, the planets all tend to be uh, quite similar. Now, another trend that we're noticing is that the planets tend to get bigger as you go farther away from the star. And you especially see that in this system. So you've got three very similar ones in close, three very similar ones a little farther away, and then you've got two about the size of Saturn and Jupiter a little uh, farther uh, out. So. Uh, the biggest one is a little bit bigger than the Jupiter, and the smallest one uh, is a little bit uh, smaller than, uh, than Saturn. Now, the other difference is these eight planets are all jammed tightly together. They're not spread out. Uh, so for example, here are the solar system's uh, eight uh, planets. So you see four in close, and then you see the four gas giants quite a bit farther away. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Often people think that it's kind of an even distribution, nothing like that at all. Basically, you've got four rocky planets in really close, and then the gas giants go way out. Here's uh, Neptune, literally more than 3 billion miles away from the Sun, compared to the Earth, which is 93 million miles away from the Sun. Now, what I'm going to do in the next slide is actually show you uh, the distribution of uh, the distances relative to the solar system. Okay? Yes? Can you have a strange point on the bottom? 
Other screen? Okay, point the other screen because it's where the camera works, sorry. All right. Okay. What you'll notice is all eight of Kepler 90's planets orbit uh, the, uh, their star from about the distance of the Earth all the way inward. Okay, so here we got Mercury. And notice you've got four of Kepler 90's planets orbiting its star closer than Mercury orbits our star. And here's Venus. Venus is just a little bit farther away than the seventh planet. So seven of the planets are orbiting their star closer than Venus orbits our sun. And then the Earth and the most distant planet are about the same distance uh, from their host stars. So this idea that they found a solar system or a planetary system just like ours, it's really nowhere near like ours. However, it's typical. Uh, what you see in Kepler-90 is quite typical of other multi-planet systems. Uh, the planets all tend to be roughly the same size and they tend to be bunched tightly together instead of being spread apart like they are uh, in our solar system. And this is, yes, go ahead. Um, is their sun about the same as ours? Okay, their star is uh, bigger and brighter. Uh, it's almost <coughs> twice as bright as, uh, it's about 20% bigger in diameter, about 20% more massive, and it's almost double the brightness of the sun. Uh, and it will burn up much more rapidly than our sun will. It's an F-type star as opposed to a G-type star. Yes? Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay, we're going to talk about the Goldilocks zone because this is really the big problem with NASA's announcements about how the fact that we're on the verge of finding a planet that houses life. Yes? Do does the fact that those planets are all so close to their star affect their orbital stability? The orbits are relatively stable. However, it would be a big problem in that, for example, these inner ones are all going to be tidally locked. In fact, there's a there's a possibility that all of them are tidally locked. So, um, you know, Earth is just barely far enough away from the sun not to be tidally locked. In fact, if we wait long enough, we will be tidally locked. 40 billion years from now, we will be tidally locked. So, yeah, 40 billion. So you, you, you can put that on your appointment calendar, yes. Well, that's what's interesting is that uh, 20 years ago when they were first discovering planets outside of our solar system, they said, yeah, they don't look anything like the planets in our solar system because we lack the technology to find planets as small and as distant from their stars. That's no longer the case. They've actually found planets the size of Mercury. So the full mass range they've been able to find. Now it is true that the greater the distance from the star, the more difficult it is to detect the planets. But given that they found these planets, we know there aren't Jupiter-mass planets as far away from this star as Jupiter is from Mars. Because, yeah, they've got the capability of detecting that. Apparently, uh, that's the most distant large planet. It's possible that they've said this in the release. This system may wind up with more than eight planets because it's possible you could have small ones uh, orbiting farther away that we're not able to detect yet. Or there could be really tiny ones that are orbiting really close. Not too likely because the orbits seem to be relatively stable. And if you had a lot of other planets orbiting inside, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, yes? Can you explain just a little bit about what tidally locked means? Okay, what tidally locked means is what you see with the moon. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth. Which means, okay, here's how tidal locking works. You've got the Earth here, you've got the Moon here. The Moon's not that far away, and so the gravity of the Earth on the near side of the Moon is stronger than the gravity on the far side. And the difference in those gravitational pulls is enough to slow down the rotation period of the Moon. And that works until the rotation period is exactly equal to the revolutionary period. And so the Moon takes 29 days to go around the Earth, it takes 29 days to rotate once. And consequently, we only see one side of the moon. That's the means by tidally locked. All you get is just one side facing it. So for example, Mercury and Venus are tidally locked. 
Now, they're not perfectly locked like the moon is. The moon has rigid just one face towards us all the time. What has, has happened with Mercury and Venus is that this tidal locking phenomena causes their rotation period to be as long or longer than the revolutionary period, which means for many months of the year, just one side faces the sun. And so on Mercury, for example, uh, the front side is blistering hot, the back side is super cold. So that's what tidal locking means. And yeah, it's not a good thing for life. Uh, although there's been speculation that maybe life could exist at the twilight zone uh, some of you might be old enough to remember that TV show called The Twilight Zone. <laughs> okay, I think they still show that in some uh, channels. Uh, but yeah, The Twilight Zone would be that edge where you've got tidal locking, where you know, you're on the front side, then the back side, but right at the twilight area, you could have the right temperature. I'll show you why that doesn't work in a few minutes. Uh, so yeah, if a planet's tidally locked, it's not a good candidate uh, for life. But I might as well jump into this. <coughs> okay, what NASA's been pushing literally since the first extrasolar planet has been discovered is their quest to find planets in what they call the habitable zone. You say, what on earth do they mean by the habitable zone? Well, here's a diagram. It's that distance from the star uh, where life could conceivably exist. Now, what they have here is what's called the liquid water habitable zone. It's the distance from the star where there's a possibility that water could exist on the surface between zero degrees and 100 degrees centigrade, or I think somebody was quoting Fahrenheit, yeah, Dave was, 32 to 212 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so that would be a range of distances. And they say if a planet falls within that zone, uh, the temperature zone for liquid water, uh, then there's a possibility that life could exist because we know one of the requirements for life is that there be liquid water. Okay, yes? That's not the full definition. This is like liquid water for a brief period of time. Well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thickness of the zone depends on what you mean by liquid water. We'll get to that. But one of the things that uh, you don't hear coming from NASA is that there's more than just one habitable zone. I mean, yes, water is a requirement. Another requirement is you have to have ultraviolet radiation. And you say, well, doesn't that give you sunburn? Yes. Too much ultraviolet radiation is bad for human civilization. Too much ultraviolet radiation could even be bad for bacteria. Uh, bacteria can handle a little more than we can. But you need some ultraviolet radiation. Why? Because some of the biochemical reactions that are essential for life to exist require ambient ultraviolet radiation. So you need some, but not too much. So here are some of the other habitable zones. There's the ultraviolet habitable zone, the liquid water habitable zone, and if you want photosynthetic life, and there's a good reason why you would like to have photosynthetic life, uh, that has a, a zone independent of the liquid water and ultraviolet habitable zones. There's a tropospheric ozone habitable zone. And that's based on the fact that you need tropospheric ozone. But too much is deadly, too little is also deadly. And the rotation period of the planet is, is something that must be fine-tuned, as well as the tilt of its rotation axis. And then there's the tidal locking uh, problem. And then what's called the astrophere habitable zone. And the latest one to be discovered is the atmospheric electric field habitable zone. I'll go into these briefly. But if you want the details, all you need to do is go to reasons.org and put in habitable zones, and three articles will pop up where I explain this in more detail and give you citations of literature. But let me go straight to what Dave was talking about. There's a big debate on what exactly is the liquid water habitable zone. And so the definition that's used by NASA most frequently is what I would call the ephemeral liquid water habitable zone. And that would be the zone where you've got a possibility for liquid water existing for a couple of months on at least a few square kilometers of the planet's surface. So yeah, that kind of lowers the requirement. We're not talking about the possibility of liquid water over the whole of the planet, 
just simply whether you could get liquid water on a small piece of the planet. So that kind of opens the door. Well, maybe in the twilight zone, you could have a couple of square kilometers where liquid water can exist. And yes, in the case of uh, Kepler-90, the star is bigger and burns up faster. And so there's a time window. And so the question is, well, how long do you get to keep that uh, liquid water? Uh, so as you can see, if we're talking simply ephemeral water, uh, you could uh, be 39% of the distance from a star like the sun and still be in the liquid water habitable zone. And to give you a point of comparison, uh, Mercury is 38% the distance of uh, Earth uh, from the Sun. So just put out uh, Mercury a little tad further away, it would be in the liquid water habitable zone. And then you can go twice the distance of the Earth. Astronomical unit is simply a unit we astronomers use, which means the distance of the Earth away from the Sun. So you go double the distance, that takes you way beyond uh, Mars. So with this definition, uh, you would have uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars in the ephemeral liquid water habitable zone. Okay, however, we're talking about liquid water that can remain on the planet for a few million years as opposed to a few weeks or a few months. You notice that the uh, habitable zone uh, shrinks down. Yeah, I heard they didn't want me over here. <laughs> and so what you realize is just put the Earth 1% closer to the sun, it's outside the liquid water habitable zone, but you can go as far away as 67% farther and you'd still be in the semi-permanent liquid water habitable zone and that would include the orbit of Mars. And there's some uh, evidence that indeed <coughs> Mars, four billion years ago, there was a brief moment where it had liquid water on its surface, but it didn't last. And so that's what we mean by semi-permanent. So we actually have physical evidence that the Mars uh, indeed is in this semi-permanent liquid water habitable zone. But here's the one down here. If you want liquid water to remain on the planet over a significant fraction of the planet's surface for more than a billion years, then the liquid water habitable zone really gets very, very tiny. Yes? Well, okay, today a liquid drop of water evaporates in less than two seconds. That's because the boiling point and the freezing point are the same on Mars. So that's one reason why if you do get liquid water, it doesn't last long. But yeah, early in Mars history, and by early I mean four billion years ago, uh, you had an atmosphere that was thicker than it has today, a lot of carbon dioxide which would attract heat from the sun and would have actually made the planet warm enough that you could have liquid water on its surface. The reason that was so <coughs> ephemeral is the liquid water reacted with the carbon dioxide, made carbonic acid, which then got converted into carbonates. And so what you have on Mars is what's called the carbonate crisis, uh, where the combination of carbon dioxide and liquid water leads to the leaching of the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, the water of the atmosphere, and the planet becomes cold and dry with very little atmosphere. And you'll say, how much time would that take? We're talking at most a few million years, and maybe much faster than that. And you say, why didn't that happen on the Earth? Because on the Earth there's a cycle that returns that carbon that ca those carbonates back into water and carbon dioxide. There's a carbonate cycle going on on the Earth because of our plate tectonic activity, which is not the case uh, for Mars. And so, and you need that long lasting, strong uh, plate tectonics uh, to prevent the carbonate crisis. So yeah, we do have carbonates on the Earth, uh, but there's a cycling that goes on. And so we wind up having uh, water and carbon dioxide on a permanent basis. Okay, now to show you this visually, the difference, uh, for the ephemeral liquid water, look how big the water habitable zone is. And so this explains why you got NASA saying, uh, we think there are 40 billion habitable planets in our Milky Way galaxy. They're using this definition. Well, with that definition, you're gonna have lots of planets in the liquid water habitable zone. But if you're talking uh, permanent liquid water, this is what the zone looks like. 
and that is exaggerated. <laughs> this is what it really looks like, okay? Now, I can barely see it on my screen. If you turn the lights out, you might be able to see it there, but yeah, as you can see, it's whisper thin. There it is. Yeah, you can actually see it there. So uh, that number of 40 billion is going to drop dramatically uh, once as you bring that habitable zone down to where it really does exist. Yes? Well, what I tell people is uh, when you see this on the internet, you want to go to the peer-reviewed papers. They tend to be quite concerned. This is what we discovered and this is what we've not discovered. The NASA announcements tend to hype it. After all, they're, I think they're motivated to try to get funding for their project. Uh, and then you've got all these people writing blog articles, these news outlets. They hype it even more than NASA hypes it. So NASA didn't say, uh, that this is a habitable system. That's something that the other uh, bloggers and media outlets did. Uh, or, you know, this is just like our solar system. And so, yeah, if you actually read the NASA announcement, it's more subdued. But if you read the peer-reviewed paper, it's much more subdued than that again. And so, uh, you know, when I write about this, I always try to give you a link to the actual uh, discovery. Now, in this case, it hasn't been published yet. So I wasn't able to give you the link, but what I was able to do is actually describe all the features of this. And incidentally, hats off to Google, uh, trying to pull a planet uh, out of the database where you already got seven planets uh, messing up everything, that's quite an achievement. So, uh, and you know, Google is basically saying to NASA, we're gonna help you find more planets, and uh, they probably will. In fact, just this week, uh, seven new planets have been found not because they've done any observing, it's simply mining the current database. Yes. Oh, I got two of you in the same line. I'll go to you first. <laughs> Who are you pointing to? Oh, I'll go to you first, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that's missing on all these articles is, is about the extra density of these planets because you know, when you look at this here, you have planets, and that's including Earth because it's a circular orbit. The only circular orbits that we found of these extra planets are ones that are tidally locked. The tidally locked the orbit is so close to the sun, it's usually circular. But as soon as as soon as you get untidally locked, the eccentricity of all every single one of these extra planets I I is huge, which means of course the water would freeze most of the time, and then when it did get close to the sun, it would all turn to steam and sterilize the planet. So 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 Hazel doesn't really work because we know that, that there is nothing that can live in steam. Well, that's a very good point. With tidal locking, you will get a circular orbit. And yeah, so what you see for planets that are orbiting close to their stars, you typically get circular orbits. Once you get past that, you get eccentricities, which means the ellipticity of the orbit is much greater than what you see uh, for any of the solar system planets, except for Mercury. Mercury has a slightly elliptical orbit, but typically you see uh, elliptical uh, ellipticities even greater than that of Mercury. But that's one of the amazing things of the solar system planets is how remarkably cir circular they are in spite of the fact only two of them are tidally locked. So yeah, you were next. Two part question. One, on the terminal, the, the, this sliver, is that equivalent to about one or two percent variation? Well, let me bring you back to the actual slide here. Yeah, here it is. 0.5%. Change the distance of Earth by 0.5%, you're outside that zone. Point, yeah, point oh yeah, yeah, just, just half a percent is enough to disturb things. And semi-permanent water, uh, how long is that? What do you mean by semi-permanent? It means yeah, you've got the wa water for several million years. Several yeah, not just months, but you actually have it for several million. But again, we're not talking the whole planetary surface. They're okay if it's just part of the surface. Yes? Um, doesn't even include, uh, as writer Hugh Ross has pointed out, the system uh, steaming and rise and fall of water causing fresh water, which is necessary for life, salt water, other life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but doesn't include any of those factors, correct? It doesn't. Uh, so yeah, I mean, typically, uh, if it's, you're talking water on the whole planet, best you're gonna get marine life. 
And uh, you know, another factor is uh, you not only need to be a very fine-tuned distance from the star, the planet's got to have surface continents and surface oceans. Without that, you can't recycle the nutrients that will maintain life uh, for a long period of time. So there's actually multiple requirements in order to have long-term life. Yes? And when NASA's showing the uh, liquid water habitable zone and all their literature, are they talking about the ephemeral zone? Or this is what they're talking about, which explains why they get such a huge number of estimated habitable planets. For our solar system? Or That's for the galaxy. They're basically okay. saying 40 billion habitable planets yeah. in our Milky Way uh, galaxy. Which explains why you got people like Stephen Hawking saying, you know what, we're messing up planet Earth. We need to be planning on going somewhere else. And with 40 billion planets, there's lots of places to go. Well, that's assuming that you got that kind of a wide zone. If it's really uh, like this, and we're talking human beings, it really is like that. Uh, yeah, there's really nowhere to go. Well, we better take care of this planet because there's no getting on spaceships and going to a different planet. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and that habitable zone is not going to last forever either. That's so right. You're going to start to discover little zones, 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 even if it's up there. So that's, that's not going to end either. Well, what's amazing about our planetary system, it's been habitable for 3.8 billion years. And I say what's amazing about that, that's about the maximum the laws <coughs> of physics will permit for the entire universe. What does that mean? we're going to be soon outside the habitable zone for planet Earth. And I say, why? That, that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> uh, and that's why you got people like Hawking saying, hey, the end of the line is here. We need to go somewhere else. Uh, but here's the blessing. By God putting us human beings here at the very end of the line, we get to reap the treasure chest of 3.8 billion years of biodeposits and use those biodeposits to build freeways, skyscrapers, automobiles, uh, this amazing high technology affluent civilization we're enjoying today is thanks to the fact that God put us here last. If he put us here earlier, we wouldn't have those resources to be able to have billions of people on the face of the earth. Yeah, um, your next tip. We have such a tremendously insightful president who's just telling everybody that there's fake news everywhere in the world. Why not NASA? I mean, we should just believe it. Well, that's why I'm telling people, you know, go to the peer-reviewed literature. You typically get the honest goods there because these people have to compete with one another. And uh, the other thing I noticed, in fact, I was dealing with a lot of biologists these uh, past couple of weeks and, you know, how this idea that in biology you got to tow the party line. Well, in physics and astronomy, you're actually rewarded for not towing the party line. And so challenging uh, people's uh, standard ideas is uh, really how you advance your career. And so when you put out a peer-reviewed article, it will get challenged if there's any possibility of challenging it. Do you think there's uh, any possibility that we'll eventually be able to see planets and stars outside our galaxy? Yeah, we're already doing that. Oh, we already are? Yeah. <coughs> so yeah, the, for a few of the planets, we can actually image the planets themselves. And there's actually a, a, a space mission that's being planned that'll be able to do that for thousands of planets. But right now we're talking maybe 10 where that's been done. Outside of the galaxy. Outside of our solar system. Yeah. Well, actually, they've even found planets in the Andromeda galaxy by using what's called uh, microlensing, where you're using stars that are perfectly aligned with you to create gravitational lenses that allow you to magnify uh, the image by many, many times. So, and, uh, but where they've really done, in fact, there was an astronomer attending this class from Caltech uh, a few years ago. His name is Eric Agall. In fact, I cite him in one of my blog articles. That's his research, is to use gravitational lensing to see planets tens of thousands of light years away. But where they're really reaping a big database is looking towards the center of our galaxy. Because that's where the stars are densely packed and you've got a high possibility that you're going to have, say, two stars perfectly aligned with your telescope uh, with a star behind it where planets are orbiting it where you can actually image the planets. What's interesting uh, when they've been able to do that is that they can actually detect what kind of atmosphere the planet has and how much water it has. And for the ones that are most Earth-like, 
they're typically coming in with between two and 500 times as much water as the Earth. Not surprising, because before the moon forming event, Earth also was super rich with water. Uh, thanks to the moon forming event, uh, we lost almost all our water. And so yeah, that's another thing that uh, you need to take into account is that simply finding a planet with liquid water is not enough. You need to find a planet that doesn't have too much liquid water. Because if the oceans are thousands of miles deep, which was the case for the primordial Earth, you won't get continents. Uh, just too much water for continents ever to break the surface. Yes? It is, and uh, that technology doesn't exist beyond our solar system. So yeah, I mean, uh, they can kind of estimate what the surface temperature might be, but to really get a good estimate of the surface temperature of the planet, uh, you also need to know the atmospheric uh, components. And so uh, often they're just guessing what the atmosphere is like, and therefore saying, yeah, it might be the right temperature where liquid water could exist. Now. I do agree that if you got the right temperature, you probably will have liquid water, simply because water is just so extremely abundant in the universe. I think I've mentioned this before. It's the third most abundant molecule in the universe. The most abundant is hydrogen two. The next most abundant is hydrogen three, then water comes in third. So the universe is soaking wet. So this idea of following the water, well, everywhere you go, you're going to have water if you, if you got the right uh, temperature. And if you don't have the right temperature, you still will have water. It'll just be frozen or vapor. But yeah, the quest is to find places where there's liquid water. But yeah, your probability is reasonably high given the enormous quantity of water in the universe. Yes? This is a bit of a non sequitur, but ha has, uh, have bacteria been detected on asteroids or comets? They have not been detected on asteroids or comets. They have been detected on the International Space Station's surface. However, the International Space Station orbits the Earth not too far up. And uh, there's plenty of Earth bacteria that get up that high. So it's not surprising. And then other people said, well, maybe uh, the bacteria were there before they sent the stuff up. I mean, bacteria seems to be everywhere. Have they so looked for bacteria on uh, asteroids and comets? Uh, what they've been looking for are the building blocks of uh, bacteria. So they're looking for things like amino acids, nuclear bases, and sugars. And so, uh, and they've been looking in these interstellar molecular clouds, because uh, that's the one place in our galaxy where they could be made. In fact, as an astronomer, I can tell you, we do know that the chemistry uh, that's needed to make amino acids is operating inside these dense molecular clouds. And uh, the one that's been the most prolific in revealing carbonaceous molecules is Sagittarius B2. It's a really big, dense molecular cloud near the center of our galaxy. And uh, about uh, a dozen years ago, they announced that they had found glycine uh, in that molecular cloud. That's the simplest of the 20 bioactive amino acids. Uh, and the one that uh, Uri and Miller was able to make in their uh, flask experiment. However, about five years ago, four years ago, that claim was withdrawn. They said, we misidentified the spectral lines. We did not find any glycine. Now, the caveat is this. They've been looking for glycine at uh, you know, one part uh, for 100 million or greater. And so we do know that glycine is not there at, say, one part per 10 million. Uh, if it is there, it's, it's at a much lower abundance level. Now, because we understand the chemistry of what's going on there, they will find glycine, but it's probably at a part per billion. And if it's at a part per billion, that's of no help to any origin of life uh, model. And in the same context, they claim to have found a nucleobase in that same uh, molecular cloud. And likewise, that claim was withdrawn. So, as of today, We've yet to detect glycine, any of the nucleobases, and we've not detected any of the five or six carbon sugars uh, that life needs. Is there such thing as space sickness? S 
space sickness? Well, uh, they train the astronauts who are going to go into zero gravity uh, by taking them on what's called the vomit comet. Uh, now, those of you that are older will remember an airplane that was called the Comet. It was a passenger uh, prop plane. They still have those. NASA has a couple of those. And what they do is they take people up in them and they go into a parabolic orbit uh, where for about a 40-second period you can be completely weightless. And so that's how they train uh, astronauts. They, they put them in the Vomit Comet. But they call it the Vomit Comet because the first few times you experience it, you throw up. Uh, <laughs> Zero, your body wasn't really designed for zero gravity, yeah. and so uh, your stomach uh, strongly reacts when the, the gravity isn't there. So, uh, in fact, there's an article on my uh, website uh, where I basically said, thank God for gravity, and basically pointed out how we need 1G. And life gets pretty miserable when the gravity drops to, say, 0.8 or 1.2. We really need it, the gravity to be exactly what it is on the surface of the Earth for bodies to be able to walk. Uh, in fact, what was fun is I took my younger son up to the NASA camp in uh, the San Francisco area, uh, and they actually let you experience what it's like when you're walking in lunar gravity or Martian gravity. They don't let you experience Jupiter gravity because that, that could do you some really serious harm. <laughs> so it's just lighter gravities, but it's, the interesting experience is this, you discover you can't walk if the gravity is much different than it was here on Earth. And explains why when the astronauts went to the moon, they didn't walk, they did this bunny bounce. It was the only way to stop themselves from falling over and doing themselves serious harm. They also had to weigh them down with 250 pounds a year. That extra weight helped simulate a little bit of gravity and enabled them uh, to be able to hop short distances. But notice the later Apollo missions, they sent a vehicle up with them. The reason why they gave them a vehicle, they knew they couldn't walk a very far, couldn't hop a very far distance without doing themselves serious physical harm. So they would get out of the Apollo uh, uh, spacecraft, get into the vehicle, then they would drive around. The, the lunar module. The lunar module, that's right. So that's why they put a vehicle on board, it's because it really wasn't possible for them to explore a great distance uh, because of the uh, gravity being so weak. Yes? Yeah, it seems to me like an important factor in establishing a stable environment for life that we have here is the uh, uh, tectonic activity. I, I don't, uh, and uh, okay, so then, so then if you're going to go for a planet to uh, sustain life, criteria seems to me should be that it has tectonic activity. Right. You get tectonic activity, you get it by a gradient of the gravity that we have through the Earth, which in our case was established <coughs> by the impact of, of the Mar Mars-sized asteroid on Earth. That, I mean, that's my understanding. Is that's, that's how we established that gradient of densities. And that gradient of de densities is what is really what permits us to have that tectonic activity. The fun, that's the fundamental underlying... Uh, well, that's law. the enigma of planet Earth because the density of a planet should go uh, up as you go closer and closer to the star. Well, yes, but, 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 but the, the, uh, the density goes up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a gradient of density with, within that body itself. That's true, but you're not going to get tectonics unless you've got a very dense, rocky planet. Yeah, well, well okay. So, so uh, 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 we had the impact of the Mars-sized body with us. It uh, generated a molten surroundings and the heavy material settled at the bottom. You got this, the iron core, <coughs> very heavy, and the, and the, and the gradient of, uh, of densities, I mean, that's... Well, what's special about our planet Earth, it not only has a lot of iron, which gives you the magnetic field you need to protect life, you have a huge abundance of uranium and thorium. And as you'll see in the book Improbable Planet, compared to what we expect on other rocky planets in our galaxy, we have 630 times as much thorium per unit volume and 340 times as much uranium. 
we are literally living on the uranium thorium champion of the universe. And it's because of that huge abundance of uranium thorium, we've had plate tectonic activity for four billion years. And yet you need that if you ever have any hope of advanced life. I have a chapter on that in Improbable Planet where I conclude this may be the only planet in the universe that has that feature of strong, enduring plate tectonic activity. Okay, so, so that you're saying is you can have a tectonic activity even without that density gradient. You can, but it won't be long lived. Yeah, and so that uh, I, I, where, where I was going to this okay. was, was that if, uh, if that gradient is necessary to establish a stable life uh, profile, uh, <coughs> possible to say that to establish that gradient, you actually do have to have this, uh, how else do you establish the gradient other than by this impact of another body? And I'm suggesting that as an, as an additional criteria yes. for, for, for establishing tectonic activity. You're on target, and you also need the late heavy bombardment. I mean, all those early events in Earth's history are necessary. And uh, you know, the enigma is Mercury is not the densest body in the solar system. It should be, but Earth is the densest body in the solar system. When you look at how far away we are from the Earth, our density should be half of what it is, but it isn't. Uh, we actually have a density greater than that of Mercury. And uh, so, that's because of our unique history. And this is what astronomers are gradually becoming to recognize, is that we see in these extrasolar planetary systems is the norm what we have here in our solar system is the exception. Hey, uh, I've only got another 15 minutes. Let me kind of get through this. We've talked about the liquid water habitable zone. There's the ultraviolet habitable zone. And as I said, you need a certain wavelength and intensity of ultraviolet radiation. Basically, you need long wavelength ultraviolet radiation at a certain intensity in order for critical biochemicals to be synthesized so that life is possible. But if you get too much ultraviolet radiation, then it sterilizes the planet. The only stars uh, that would have this ultraviolet radiation would be very young F-type stars and G-type stars that are younger than the sun. Now, that's one reason why I'm saying uh, we're out of here pretty quickly, because the sun is now at the maximum age in which we can remain in the ultraviolet habitable zone. As the sun gets older, we'll slip outside that ultraviolet habitable zone. But almost all the stars are eliminated from being in the ultraviolet habitable zone. Now, you say, how many? 97% of all the stars in our Milky Way galaxy, you're not going to be in the ultraviolet habitable zone. Now, the situation is more serious than that because for life to be possible, your planet has to be simultaneously in the liquid water habitable zone and the ultraviolet habitable zone. And for the vast majority of stars, you get the water habitable zone here, pardon me, it's the other way around. The ultraviolet habitable zone is here where the star is, and the water habitable zone is over here. They don't overlap. And if they don't overlap, the planet's not habitable. They both have to overlap. Now, if you want photosynthetic life, it narrows the ultraviolet habitable zone. It's much narrower. You say, well, maybe we just do without photosynthetic life. <laughs> well, as you see here, there's an advantage to photosynthetic life. The metabolic rates are 1,000 to 10 million times higher than for non-photosynthetic life. So yeah, if all your goal is to have non-photosynthetic life, you're okay, but it's only gonna be microbes, and it's gonna be microbes that really don't do much. They just kind of survive. Their whole existence is trying to survive. Uh, so they're not able to multiply, and they're also not going to be able uh, to adapt or evolve. And then there's a tropospheric ozone zone, uh, which means that you have to be, you know, it's ultraviolet radiation impinging on oxygen that makes ozone. So you won't be in the ozone zone unless you've got oxygen. And that's one thing astronomers are doing. They're looking for these planets that we can image and seeing if they can detect oxygen. Because if you can't detect oxygen, you won't have ozone. If you don't have ozone, you won't have life. Uh, because if you got too little ozone and you got life, biochemical smog builds up, which kills the life. 
I mean, trees, for example, pour out huge amounts of smog. But it's thanks to tropospheric ozone that smog gets dealt with. Now, too much ozone means you won't be able to breathe. You get respiratory failure if there's too much ozone in the atmosphere. And so this is why it's wise to avoid getting too close to certain kinds of electronics. Now, when I was uh, much younger, uh, they had issues with uh, electronics where they would pump out lots of ozone. Typically, that's not done anymore. They, they're much more cautious. But yeah, those of you who are older can remember those days when you could actually smell the ozone coming out of the electronics. And if you did that... Well, we're talking 50, 60 years ago. I mean, now we have uh, electronics where that's no longer a problem. But yeah, there was a day when you didn't want to get too close to those things when you kind of had that uh, smell coming out. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Ah, the Bluetooth, yeah, okay. Is that cool? Well, there is some evidence that you got to watch your smartphones because you, you're putting them by your ear that's really close to your brain. And what they tell you is there's no problem as long as you don't have that iPhone by your ear more than four hours a day. <laughs> However, uh, studies show that uh, there are teenagers that spend an average of nine hours a day on their phones. Fortunately, they're doing it down here, which is far enough away from the brain. So as long as they're texting for nine hours, not a problem. But if they're like this for more than four hours a day, yeah. <laughs> That might explain why your teenagers are behaving the way they are. That could be. All right. How about hearing aids? No. Hearing aids typically aren't an issue, but phones are because you know, there's a lot of, lot of juice there. Yeah. And they're transmitting and receiving. Yes. How, how about smart TVs? Okay. Just, 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 just a quick one. The habitable zone is going to be part of the fine tuning. Yes. And then there's a long, long list beyond that. That's true. Yeah, this is just one part of the fine-tuning requirements. But what's interesting is that virtually every year that goes by, we find another habitable zone. I'm trying to keep you up to date with that. Right now, we know of nine. There could be more than nine, but there's nine that we know of. So these are the first five. I have a question. How much light do you get from the sun? Okay. The rate at which a planet rotates affects the cloud uh, reflectivity. And if you've got a fast rotating planet, it's going to warm the planet up. And likewise, uh, the tilt of the rotation axis, a higher obliquity, will warm the planet up. And this is where you run into problems with tidal locking. Okay, where you've got tidal locking, and the vast majority of habitable planets that NASA has discovered, what they call habitable, they're tidally locked. It's the vast majority are tidally locked. But their idea is, well, maybe we could have liquid water on the twilight zone. The problem with tidal locking is that it moves water from the day side to the night side. And when you move water from the day side to the night side, it freezes. And so it permanently goes into a frozen state. So what it means is if you've got tidal locking, yeah, you're going to have water there, but it's all going to be ice. Because the vapor in the liquid on the day side is going to move uh, to the night side where it will freeze and be unavailable for life. The other thing about tidal locking, uh, we already heard, it forces the planet into a near circularly perfect orbit. The other thing it does, it forces the tilt to go to zero. So our tilt is 23 and a half degrees. Where you got tidal locking, it puts it right back up at zero which means you're not going to get the climate variability that we have here on the Earth, which means you're only going to have a limited part of the planet uh, where life would be possible. And if you want to avoid tidal locking, the, sun, the star's mass has got to be equal to the sun's to within 1%. And you say, well, couldn't you just have a bigger star and move farther away? Well, with a bigger star, you're now going to have uh, more intense radiation coming out from that star. You're going to have more ultraviolet radiation uh, which is going to take it outside the ultraviolet habitable zone. And the bigger the star, the faster it burns up, and the more uh, it's going to change in its luminosity. And that's a problem for life. And so my friends who are involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, I've been telling them, don't even think about it unless the star is within 1% of the mass of the sun. If it's not that close to the mass of the sun, you know from the star's characteristics itself there's no possibility for anything more advanced uh, than microbes on that planet. 
And then a more recently discovered one is the astrosphere habitable zone. And it's basically making the point that our planet Earth is delicately balanced between us being zapped by solar radiation and us being zapped by cosmic radiation. And so the wind and the radiation coming out from the sun pushes away the cosmic radiation, uh, but it's such that we're at that delicate point where we get equally blasted by solar radiation and cosmic radiation, which means that the cosmic radiation doesn't kill us and the solar radiation doesn't kill us. They balance one another off. But that means that your planet has to be at that point. And that's another reason why you don't want to go with a bigger star, because a bigger star is going to blast out a lot more uh, stellar radiation. Uh, and that will take you outside the habitable zone. Yes? No, no more questions from <laughs> Okay. Let me just finish this up then since I am running out of time. The last one discovered is the atmospheric electric field. And this is another reason why all those planets that NASA tells you are habitable, the vast majority are not. Why? Because they're orbiting their stars closer than the Earth orbits the Sun. And they've been able to measure the atmospheric electric field on Venus it's about 10 volts. And because it's 10 volts, those 10 volts will completely desiccate the planet. So it explains why Venus is bone dry. So if you've got an atmosphere, now Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. But if it's got an atmosphere, you need an atmosphere for life. If you've got an atmosphere and it's that close to the star, it will have an electric field strong enough that it'll desiccate the planet. And so Earth is far enough away where our voltage is a little bit below two volts. Not strong enough to desiccate a planet, uh, but uh, yeah, planets closer, uh, there is that problem. And let me just wrap up with this. The duration and how long a planet can stay in a habitable zone, it depends on the organism. So if you're talking non-photosynthetic microbes, uh, the duration is much longer than it is for photosynthetic uh, microbes. And then if we're talking eukaryotes, where you've got a nucleus in the cell, uh, the duration shrinks down. And for talking human beings, it drops down to a few tens of thousands of years. So the habitable duration for us is very, very short. And one reason why it's so short is we have to be here when we're not being zapped <coughs> by big flares. Uh, matter of fact, what's really amazing is we're in a window of time right now where there's been no Carrington events in the last 150 years. 1859, there was a major flare that knocked out the uh, worldwide telegraph system, uh, even uh, ignited uh, some telegraph poles caught fire. Some telegraph operators uh, were getting electric shocks as a result of this solar flare. And uh, the flare was so bright that it caused uh, an aurora borealis to be seen in Colorado and Utah, uh, where miners there thought it was uh, daytime when in fact it was the middle of the night. Uh, you could read newspapers by it. If that were to happen today, it would shut down the electric power grid. And uh, in fact, uh, a report came out from our government, federal government, where it said, if we were to have an event like that that was twice as strong as what happened in 1859, we could be without electric power for a period of two years. <laughs> now, they say, now what's the big deal about that? 100 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> here's the big deal. The big, I think I talked about this before in the class, so let me just wrap it up. But here's the big deal. If you don't have an electric power grid, the maximum population <coughs> you can sustain in the United States is about 35 million people. Our population is 335 million. So uh, we need to get that power grid up in a hurry. And right now, we don't have the transformer storage capacity to get it up any faster than about two years. Which is why our government is actually thinking about building a big factory that can turn out 30,000 transformers in a space of a few weeks. It'd be expensive, that's a great insurance policy. Why? Because in 1770, uh, it was 1765, there was a Carrington event twice as powerful as the one that happened in 1859. So even now we're at risk, but here's the good news. There isn't a single star in our Milky Way galaxy where the flaring activity is less than what we have here uh, in our solar system. We're living in the most flare safe place in our Milky Way galaxy. So yeah, as you go home today, enjoy your lunch, you might want to thank God for the fact 
that he put us on the safest, we're orbiting the safest star in our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, however, I mean, within a few hundred years, we could have an event that won't kill you, it won't ruin your crops, but it sure can do a mess to your GPS system. And so uh, don't get too dependent on GPS. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I say that because a research paper got published where it said that people under the age of 35 living in uh, high technology nations like the United States, their hippocampus is shrinking. That's the part of the brain that helps you find where you are. It's a direction finder. And as uh, that part of the brain shrinks, and it's just like what happens. I mean, you're dealing with the fact that you've got muscle atrophy, that you have to kind of get those muscles back. Same thing happens with the brain. If you don't use that part of the brain, it disappears. And, uh, and if your GPS system goes out, you're in real trouble. So I just thought I'd end this class with some really good news. <laughs> so once in a while, try to find where you're going without your GPS system, just to make sure that part of the hippocampus doesn't completely disappear. With that, let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of the year where we get to celebrate your incarnation. Thank you that you, the creator, decided to come and spend time with us as a baby, as a, with a human body, and show us an example of uh, perfect morality. And show us, Lord, the pathway by which we can receive eternal life in communion uh, and love uh, with you. Thank you for this time of the year. We have so many opportunities to share with people who are not yet believers in Jesus Christ the good news that you came here 2,000 years ago. And Lord, that you yourself provided a means by which we can be saved from all the disasters that are bound to come here on the earth. You've paved the way. You've got a new planet for us, way beyond the physics of this universe. And Lord, we look forward to that. And we look forward to the time we get to celebrate at the Christmas party at the Matthews uh, this evening. May that be a time of great joy and celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.